Monterey Car Week has numerous events, and a popular one is the Porsche Club of America's Works Reunion. The Works hosts many Porsche personalities, like Hurley Haywood, a master of the 24-hour endurance races. One of the greatest drivers in uh, sports cars there is, and probably still can go out there and turn some amazing laps, Hurley Haywood. Uh, recognizable from anywhere at any Porsche event, uh, and Harley uh, Harley came out with a book, which has. Uh, are you in the second printing or still in the first printing? No, we're still in the first printing, but it's uh, really doing well. It's everybody loves to the read. Uh, one of the caveats that I sat down with with Sean Criblin was that I wanted a book that not only talked about the racing but also just talked was a good story, so you could be a non-racing fan and still enjoy reading the book and the book is such a beautiful book and I, I'm so proud of it it's got you know 650 photos in it 400 pages weighs seven pounds and uh, we're selling it here on the back side of the uh, vendor row over there so anybody that wants the book I'll be here till 11 o'clock signing Once outsiders, but now achieving legitimacy, are the Porsche Outlaws. And one of the originals is Rod Emery, who created his own version of a 356 and recently meticulously restored the first Porsche to win at Le Mans. We pick up an interview with Manny Alvarez, past PCA president, with Rod Emery. Be prepared, Emery is as detailed in his stories as he is in his cars. Um, I'll just give you a quick little kind of history on the, these cars and, and then what we ended up doing to, to rebuild it. But um, when Porsche built their, their four cars to compete at Le Mans, um, they started with uh, some leftover Gamoon, the aluminum bodied cars, uh, which were production based cars. They built 50 of these cars in Gamoon, Austria before they moved uh, their their operation back to Germany, and the reason they chose the aluminum cars was uh, because the you know the lightweight nature and and the aerodynamics of the cars. And when they made the decision to to race in 1951, they they decided in Porsche you know fashion to to modify the cars and and build in certain redundancies and and also um, you know do some testing and some aerodynamic testing. And so if you look at um, the four cars that were that were initially produced, the roof lines were a little bit different, and the the fender skirts were different, and there were some changes. Um, and when they showed up at Le Mans with the two cars, uh, you know, it's not a very um, high horsepower car. It's got 45 horsepower, um, and uh, they began the race, um, you know, with two French drivers, and the car just performed flawlessly. Uh, they won the race because of endurance, speed, um, and also just preparation. Uh, there's a few things in this car just in case um, things wouldn't have gone their way. You can see there's an extra windshield wiper that's you know up here that that's operated. There's also an extra fuel system, so the car has its mechanical uh, fuel pump on the engine and and a, a switch just like you know all other 356s. The wiper was that hand operated or no? Power? It's actually an electric operated one, but. Um, but it's uh, it was there, and the extra wiper blade is actually in the wooden toolbox in the back. So um, they didn't have to use it uh, during the event. They were able to you know get through with the regular wipers. Um, but there was there was also an electric fuel pump system that uh, just in case they would have needed more fuel on the straights or if, or if uh, it would have gotten to a point where they the mechanical pump gave out. But they just build in redundancies, uh, also extra ignition systems and and those things. And and you know as we look at Porsche today, you know the the, the winningest manufacturer at Le Mans, um, it's it's the same thing. They just carry that same tradition and passion. And and so for me to have an opportunity to uh, uh, to kind of bring this car back to life was was a real honor um, because it's uh, this car uh, it is is really what has inspired everything that. You know, I've done my entire career as well as uh, as you know a lot of the things that my dad and, and uh, family have done to these cars. And this the company was only three years old, so it's when you see the 919 and the army of engineers they had supporting the car. But this was a family 
that was competing at Le Mans with the big names. So this was a big jump for them. It really was. I mean, Porsche was a relatively small company. They had just, uh, you know, the, the first 50 cars were, were built in Gmund Austria, and then, and then uh, they had just relocated back into Germany and were building their steel body cars. So Reuter was actually stamping or, or, or handcrafting the, the, the steel body cars at that time. And, and uh, it was just really the beginning. Uh, you know, this car was right at the transition when they went from the VW style uh, uh, drum brakes. Like this still has uh, steel uh, drums with an aluminum finned outer um, ring on them to dissipate heat. Um, it has a, a crash box, and it was just right after this car was developed that, that the 356s then uh, had a synchro mesh gearbox and also uh, went to the big aluminum drums. So there was a lot of, so much advancement and so much uh, development in that period of time. And I'm guessing, not to get political, but in 1951, I wouldn't think the French were big fans <laughs> of German cars. So that's probably why they had French drivers. Well, yeah, so the number 47 car had two German drivers. Uh, the number 46 had two French drivers. And, and yeah, you could imagine, it was just a few years uh, after the war. And, and uh, the story, as I know it, the reason the car has two different seats, uh, the passenger seat is a reclining seat, because the, the, uh, the crew was, was asked to, they had to physically drive the cars from Germany to Le Mans. Um, it's not like the days of, you know, of today with big transporters and airplanes. And so um, because they were, they feared that the cars might be uh, vandalized or, or damaged in the overnight stay on the trip, uh, the mechanic was required to, uh, to sleep in the passenger seat. And um, it's just, yeah, there's a lot of really cool stories that were uncovered when we, uh, when we really started doing the research of the car. And, um, you know, so this car had a very significant history uh, with Porsche under the factory, um, but it also has a, a, an extremely significant history here on the West Coast in, in uh, spurring sports car racing for Porsche here in the U.S. Um, there's, a, there's a 1952 America Roadster that'll be at uh, Pebble Beach that the Road Scholars are introducing this week. Uh, there's a lot of photos of this car. If you follow Road Scholars on their Instagram account, I recommend you do. There's a lot of, uh, it's really cool to see uh, the cars they're bringing back and restoring. But they have a, an America Roadster that, um, that they've just got through restoring that was competing side by side with this car. But this car from 1952 until 2009 didn't have a roof. Um, it was a convertible. So what happened was uh, as soon as this car was was done uh, winning Le Mans, then it did the liege Rome liege Rally, and then it uh, was the 1100cc record holder in Montmorency, so the speed trials, and then Porsche sold their race cars uh, to Max Hoffman, who was the importer in the U.S., and so in January of 1952, this came to the States along with... Um, two other cars, one that uh, eventually Vic Skirmitz had that is now at the Collier Museum, uh, which is chassis number 55, and then um, there's chassis 54, which uh, went to Mexico. Uh, so if you see photos of an early Gamund in the Le in the Locker of Panamericana race, that's chassis number 54. This is chassis number 63. So they came to the U.S. in 1952 uh, in this configuration without numbers on them. And this car raced three races. So it raced Pebble Beach Road Races, uh, Torrey Pines, and Golden Gate Park. And right after that, John Von Neumann, who, was, uh, who had competition motors, he was a, a sports car racer and owned a dealership, uh, he thought he'd lighten the car up. So in 1952, he had the roof dashed and the whole rear of the car cut off and made it a convertible. And uh, so, you know, thought he'd lighten it up and hot rod it a little bit. He was in the valley, which is really where all the, you know, uh, custom car builders and uh, hot rodders uh, were at. And so he had a guy named Neil Deep, who was a coach builder, really cut the roof off and, and remove all that. And the car was in that configuration um, for a number of years. And then a guy by the name of Chuck Forge, who was a Bay Area uh, engineer, he bought the car in 1956 and raced it just about every year as a convertible, a little red roadster. Uh, up until 2009, and in 2009, um, I was at the uh, Monterey Historics along with my client Cameron Healy, and um, you know, uh, admiring the car again and uh, as a roadster, and asked Chuck if he was ever going to sell it. He said he was never going to sell it, and um, unfortunately, he passed away uh, a month later, and the car came on the market, and at that point, um, we purchased the car, 
and um, it was then uh, about a three-year process to um, go through all the due diligence and research to confirm that for sure it was the the first Porsche race car and the first uh, car to win the 24 Hours of Le Mans for Porsche, and that's when the restoration began. And it was uh, it was really our goal to to do an authentic period point in time restoration on the car to not over restore it. These were handmade cars, and uh, things weren't perfect. So if you look at the the hood gap, you know, as funky as it is, and the door gaps, and how the doors don't seem to fit perfect, and um, you know, the, the body lines aren't absolutely perfect. That's what makes it so special because it's perfectly imperfect. And and um, our goal was to just bring it back to exactly how it was with the hand painted numbers. And um, there's no better time to have this car uh, back and available than for Porsche's 70th anniversary. So obviously, Porsche must not have realized what this car was when it came for sale or and did they have records were you able to use any of their, i know they keep great records but that's going really far back yeah so if you go back to the early days at porsche 1952 53 um there were some records but there was no documentation on the chassis numbers and what cars entered the race and because race cars are often bounced from event to event and, and chassis numbers weren't really that important the the the, the long-term you know history of the car wasn't something that was on the forefront of their mind and so the documentation that did exist uh, there was a fire and, and some of that was lost um, everybody knew that this was one of the four cars that were prepared for Le Mans. There's a book called The Last Eleven, uh, written by uh, Phil Carney and, and um, Jacques Mertens. Great book that talks about the history of what they call The Last Eleven, which is the 356 SL lightweight cars. Um, and in that book, it says that this is possibly one of the cars that went to Le Mans. That was uh, 2009 or 10 when it was written. Um, but the history just wasn't there. And so what we had to do was was um, go off of, uh, initially, we had a hunch that it was the car. Um, Luke Hintz, who was um, the one working with, with uh, Chuck Forge's estate, he had uh, accumulated some, or put together some data that, that said, again, it could possibly be. But there were certain physical characteristics about this car that, um, that stood out, and stood out to me in particular because I've loved this car my whole life, and um, you know I've loved the split window. I've loved the the body bumpers and the hood straps and the hood handle and the grills on the headlights. And if you look at the first car that I built alongside with my dad, which was a '53 coupe, um, I took a '53 coupe and we we essentially modeled it, or it was inspired by this. It wasn't originally a split window car. We split the windshield. It wasn't originally a body bumper car. We put body bumpers on it. It wasn't originally had hood straps and all that other stuff. So this car was the, the catalyst for what, you know, really my dad and I and my family has done hot rotting these cars. And so this car being so special to me, I've always looked at it a little different maybe than anybody else. And there's one thing that stood out to me years ago, and that's this door handle pocket. So the, the size of that pocket behind the door handle. Um, if you look at all the historic photos of all the cars, um, including chassis 55 that, that Vic Skirmitz had and, and chassis 54 that Roberto Bender has. Those cars, in the photographs, it was a shorter pocket and more of a teardrop shape rather than a big oval. Also, you could see the roof line was different and the peak on the windshield was different. So this car was different than the other two. Um, th there were four cars built. One was totaled in pre-race testing, so there's only three cars that, that exist. This car was different than the other two, so it was like, why is that? You know, why is the dash different? Why are the, you know, these little things different on the car? So it started this three-year process of digging deep to figure out, I know we can prove it. So we took the car to bare metal. I located where the gas filler was. I located where the hood straps were, and I 3D scanned this car along with Miles Collier's car and started overlaying the data and saw that these cars, because they're handmade, you can't interchange hoods, you can't interchange doors. So it's not like the stuff was mixed around. So I knew that we were on a path. One thing led to another, and there were 14 physical characteristics about this car that proved beyond a shadow of a doubt that it was the Le Mans winning car. I put together a, a big binder of all the documentation. We presented it to Porsche uh, right before Rensport, and they put out a press release, and, and that's when we knew that this was the car. But on, on top of that, if we're going to prove the history of this, we also need to provide data and history to the other owners of the other cars and help them 
fill in the missing pieces. And so we were able to confirm for sure that uh, chassis number 55 was the car that was the 1500 uh, Montfleury record holder, as well as the, uh, uh, the car that went to Liège from Liège with this car. Uh, and then chassis number 54 was the number 47 car. So for me, it was just a, an amazing journey of, of helping fill in the little holes in history and then to have an opportunity to bring this thing back. It's just uh, yeah, amazing. This is your crowning achievement, I guess. Up to uh, date, maybe? You know, this is, um, I can't say, that. it's, it's kind of like having kids. Do you ever tell one of your kids that they're your favorite? I've got my favorite. Well, I don't. I, I, I love them you know, equally as much. They just have different, uh, different characteristics that I love about them. Um, this car, for sure, is, is probably the most significant car I'll ever have an opportunity to lay my hands on. I mean, I had to build a new roof for it, new deck lid, new dash. Um, you know, I was able to save all the lower body work, uh, all the door inner structure, the chassis. So I was able to save and restore about 80% of the car. Uh, I had to remake the 20% that was no longer there. And I used some technology for that, but went back to old school, um, you know, techniques of power hammers, English wheels, and, and gas welding to, to bring this car back to a historically significant point in time and leave those character flaws that make the car so special, including the semi-flat paint and the hand-painted numbers and all that. So this car is very special to me. The car over there, that uh, that was my first um, fully heavily modified car that, uh, uh, that I built. Um, and I can tell you about that a little bit later. But if, if I have to choose my, you know, I can't choose. Each one of, you know, my cars is, is something special to me. I think the Porsche community is very happy that you brought this back to life. And we can say that the first car to win Le Mans, the class, it still exists. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Yes, definitely. And thank you. And, and really the catalyst for uh, the 356 Outlaws that, uh, you know, our family has built. And I think uh, so many of us, um, you know, get to enjoy now the, the, the fun of taking a, a production Porsche and giving it our own, you know, uh, flavor and, and, you know, some, some specific things to make it our own. And, you know, for Porsche, they took one of their production cars and modified it to go racing. And, um, you know, with this week or this event uh, celebrating outlaw cars and, and modified cars, um, to me, it's, uh, uh, it's, it's really special because there were a lot of years when there was really no place for us, uh, you know, on the grass with some of our cars. And so, um, you know, it's, it, it's really cool to be part of this. It's, uh, I was just thinking about that. Evidently, there was a time before I got involved in this where um, that whole farm welcome them. Or, you know, they were, everyone wanted stock or, or the original. Yeah, you know, it's uh, full concord, um, you know, um, stock restorations have always been a thing, you know, really to honor, you know, the cars as they were built and intended from Porsche. But if you look at Porsche themselves, they've always taken their cars and, and done some modifications, whether it's to go racing or preparing it for Liège from Liège Rally or, you know, to do speed trials. And so, um, you know, now that the community has embraced uh, customization and, and uh, you know, improvements on the cars, it, it's really cool. And to have PCA uh, embrace that as well, I think, you know, it, you look at the crowd here and, and we have everybody from the purists that are into full Concours cars uh, to the newer generation that, that you know, are drawn to the 400R Gunther Works car and, and everything in between. And, and I think that's what a true club and club spirit is all about. It's, uh, it's utilizing the car as the catalyst to bring the community together. And um, I'm just grateful that PCA, you know, is really the one leading the charge in that. Yeah, it's, it's great to have the outlaws because they're so unique and they have such small details that uh, the owners are happy to tell you about what you hear about them. You're just, you spend a long time looking at one car and how much love and devotion was put into this building. Yeah, no, absolutely. It's, uh, you know, it's a lot of, of all-nighters and sleepless nights and, uh, you know, getting the people around you to help you, uh, you know, create your, your dream car and, and uh, um, you know, so like the car that's over there. We, yeah, let's walk over. By the so, way, I know you said to follow Road Scholar on uh, Instagram, which I do, but your Instagram, uh, <laughs> you do a great job of posting uh, updates and what you're working on and your different projects. Um, I highly recommend 
if you are on Instagram, join Instagram and follow Rod because it's uh, your craftsmanship is incredible. You, you're not just someone posing with the car. You're building these things, and a lot of the videos you post or pictures are you in there making it happen. Yeah, no, I appreciate that. And, you know, social media, uh, you know, it has its good points and its bad points. And I think for us as car enthusiasts, it's um, it's a really great way for us to share the passion and to be able to, you know, look inside the keyhole of each other's shops or uh, or garages and, and, and share those stories. And, um, you know, I've found that it's a really great way to inspire the next generation and to also get, uh, you know, new interest into the love of these cars that we have. And, you know, I've got a really great crew in the shop. Uh, there's 14 of us, and um, you know, if you get on my Instagram, you'll see that I highlight all the the crew in my shop. I've got a number of them here this weekend, and um, yeah, my that's Instagram is kind of my main channel because it's kind of no BS. It's a uh, it's it's pictures and some uh, some information and no politics. No <laughs> politics. Yeah, um, yeah. If you're gonna post politics, I won't follow you. I just it's all about cars and family um, for me. So. Um, but yeah, this this car here was uh, uh, really, you know, this is a special car, um, and you'll even see it says special on it. But to kind of, to kind of date back a little bit to how I got started doing all this, um, my grandfather was a customizer back in the 40s and 50s. Uh, his name was Neil Emery, and he had a shop called Valley Custom Shop, and he was really one of the pioneers of um, channeling and sectioning a car and. When I say channeling, that's when you take the body of a car, say like a, you know, a 1944, and you you lower the body down over the frame. So that's channeling. And then when you hear the term chan or sectioning a car, that's where you take uh, like a certain section out of the body and make the car look thinner. And then there's chopping the top, which is lowering the windshield. And so those are the three kind of main custom techniques: channeling sectioning or chopping tops. And my grandfather didn't chop tops much. He was more of a channel and section guy um, because he wanted to take cars and, and really enhance or, or evolve the body shape but not make it look so um, like obvious and, and to really just kind of refine the shape. So he had a shop until 1961 and then uh, he was offered an opportunity to work at a Porsche dealership. So before 1961 it was all about uh, Chevys and Fords and, and customizing and then in 1961 he was the body shop manager at Chick Iverson Volkswagen Porsche H. and uh, he ran the body shop there and then my father when he graduated high school, Gary Emery which is uh, at the table over there, he, uh, he began detailing cars and then became parts manager of Chick Iverson Volkswagen Porsche um, and so growing up as a kid, you know, I had two of the most amazing mentors to, you know, to have. My grandfather, who was one of the, you know, the, the pioneers and one of the greatest craftsmen I knew, and my dad with this amazing design eye and uh, love for Porsches. And so when I was 14 years old, I was given an opportunity to, to restore a car and build a car alongside my dad. And um, I had been racing motocross and uh, I worked for a drag race team before that, so I was all about performance and speed, but then about style with my grandfather and my dad. And, and so I built this little 53 coupe, which was inspired by the, the, the number 46 car. Um, and that car was finished when I was 16 and I raced that. Um, but then fast forward about um, eight years, and um, I really wanted to build a car that was kind of my signature car that kind of encompassed all of that, you know, the, um, something that was um, just very different but still had kind of a Porsche prototype feel. I had just been married a couple of years and uh, we knew that Porsche's uh, 50th anniversary was coming up, so that was 20 years ago, uh, technically last weekend. And um, <laughs> we found a, a 64 Cabriolet that was really rusted out and my wife and I wanted to do a road trip. Uh, we wanted to be able to travel around the Western United States, and, and so I thought, oh well, I'll, you know, we'll build a car and we'll we'll load our luggage in it and we'll, we'll go. Well, then about three months into doing the restoration, we found out that she was pregnant and that we were uh, going to have our first baby two months before uh, we were supposed to go on this road trip. So if you notice there's a trailer hitch on the back of the car, uh, that's because all of a sudden there's three of us, not just two of us, doing this road trip. And my wife, who was uh, 21 at the time, she's like, she's like, you know, we've never done this before with a kid, but I think we're going to need a lot of stuff. 
we're going to need a stroller, and we're going to need, you know, all this stuff on our road trip. So that's why we built a trailer hitch and then restored a little uh, trailer to go behind it so that we could drive this from Oregon to Monterey and then travel around and show our baby off to all of our family. Um, but I, I, like everything I do, I overdo everything, and we didn't just want to restore it. I, I started changing everything. So um, like this car started as a 64 Cabriolet, now mechanically, the stuff that you can't see, it has 944 Turbo S trailing arms in the rear. It's got a 911 gearbox. The front suspension's been moved up. It's got huge Turbo S brakes. Um, and the engine, uh, which was built by a gentleman, Dean Polopoulos, this was his prototype engine. He took a three, like a 3.3 turbo engine, cut the center two cylinders out of it, welded it back together. So it's, it's a four cylinder version of a 911 engine. Um, and then, you know, just mechanically, it's got all kinds of stuff that we did. But visually on the outside, um, we wanted to take some cues from like what my grandfather did, channeling and sectioning. You can't just channel a 356 because there just isn't enough room. So instead, I rolled the doors and rockers all the way to the floor to change kind of the, the light lines on the car. So if you look, rather than the door coming straight down, it rolls under. And then I wanted the car to sit low, but I didn't want the wheels to be jammed up in the fenders. So I raised the wheel arch up, and then the nose was smashed in like so many 356s. And, and so when I put the new nose panel on, I leaned it back. But if I'm going to lean the nose back, then I'm going to lean the windshield back. So I also leaned the windshield back. And I wanted the front to look more 550. So I lowered this point and then also lowered the cowl so that I could build a flat hood um, that was just a little bit more you know, sleek and smooth. Do you um, draw this ahead of time, or is it all in your head? Uh, it's all in my head. So, um, yeah, there's, there's, uh, and that's kind of still the way that I build cars today. Um, you know, uh, just come up with the ideas and figure out how to put all the pieces together. You have to remember also, I, my dad was in the parts business, right? So I grew up um, not like the average kid. I wasn't playing with, with Legos and Tinker Toys. I was in the back of my dad's parts department trying to figure out how to put Porsche parts together. And so that's why this car is kind of a combination of 944 stuff, 911 stuff, 908 stuff, just all that. And so, um, yeah, it was just taking all that and just giving this car as much kind of character as I could. And um, when I cut the original nose off, so like this area was damaged, but the original nose was still good in the center. So I took the original nose and then put it on the back. So. This area from here to here is the original nose, and that allowed like a larger opening for the deck lid. So I, I retained as much of the original sheet metal as I could. This is just the original nose panel. Um, and then that kind of stretched the tail out the way that I wanted. And because we leaned the windshield back, it also lowered the top. So Had that done, been done before? No. Nope. In the front to the back? No, uh, not that I know of. So, um, you know, and... It, and Every part on the car, uh, we wanted. I wanted the car to have as much um, like Porsche DNA in it as possible, even down to the wheels. And I can remember talking to my dad, and I'm like, you know, we got to find something that's different, but something that that is a little more modern and timeless, but has a little character of like the old Glockler Spiders. And a friend of ours had a uh, uh, '93 RS America. And uh, that's the space, space Saver wheel off of the RS America, and so we widened them to a 7. Um, so even that has a part number. But the goal was just use as many Porsche parts as we could and um, you know, create something a little different and special. It's, it's, it's phenomenal. To me, it's a piece of art. It's, uh, I don't know if the skill can be taught. I think at a certain level, you just have to have that artistic talent. Well, thank you. And, uh, you know, I mean, we did it uh, because we wanted to honor Porsche and kind of their 50th anniversary and drive something special. And, um, you know, my wife and I started our trip in Oregon, towing our little camp trailer, all of our gear in the little trailer in the back. And then uh, we even, because we had a three-month-old son, uh, I took the car seat out of my wife's car and then we upholstered it to match the, the car too. So, um, you know, I think if you look, it still has like the old, uh, yeah, there's, there's the, the car seat, what is it, Gary, yeah, Gary or Jerry or whatever it is. But, um, so Zane sat in the back, my wife sat in the driver's, or passenger seat, 
I made that recline for her because I knew if I was going to require her to, to ride around in this thing for 4,500 miles that she had to be comfortable and a race seat wasn't going to cut it. My seat was a race seat, but hers reclined. Um, we needed room for diapers and all that other stuff, so I eliminated the, the door panels and opened up the pocket so she could stuff all the diapers in the door and um, on the dash so I could give her a you know, fresh flower and we could you know, drive around and um, um, you know, just experience. You know, we were married uh, three, three and a half years and we had our child and we wanted to just kind of cruise around. But there was one thing when I was building it, or actually two things that when I was building it I didn't um, really think through and that was that the car was going to be done in August and um, we were going to be taking a two and a half month old baby and tour the United States and there's a good chance it was going to be over 100 degrees and no air conditioning and kind of all that stuff. And so just before we left, Amy says, uh, you know, it's going to be really hot. How are we going to keep our little baby cool? And um, so kind of at the last minute, I took a, a small ice chest, put a 12-volt fan on one side, louvered a panel for the other side. And every two hours, we would stop and get a block of ice. And that was strapped in the passenger seat over there. So he was happy as a fat little clam back here uh, with air conditioning blowing on him and uh, we went 4,500 miles. Um, the only, after doing all this modification and all the stuff that we did to it, uh, we, when I got the car done, we hooked the trailer up, I drove it to the gas station because in typical car builder fashion, um, I didn't sleep for four days leading up to when we were leaving and um, I had never test driven it before the day we were leaving and so I drove it to the gas station and um, you know I get in I go to shift it and uh, you know first gear is over here instead of over here and reverse was in a weird spot and I'm like oh my gosh you know I can't believe I built this entire car and I didn't think about the shift linkage orientation because I put a 901 gearbox in it but at the last minute I wanted to make the shifter look like a, an old spider shifter and so I forgot one pivot point, right, in the shifter. And so, you know, now I gotta figure out, am I gonna drive this thing with first, second, third, fourth, you know, and I, so, uh, so anyways, I uh, brought it back to the shop, built a new shifter for it, and I said, okay, it's time to go. And uh, then we load everything in the trailer, and uh, kind of last minute we figure out that, um, uh, you know, the weight of the trailer, you know, kind of overpowers the springs on the trailer, uh, because the trailer was light, but when you put a thousand pounds worth of stuff in it. Um, so we had to adjust that, but then we got in the car, we drove to Monterey, we went 4,500 miles, and uh, the trip was flawless. So um, that was 20 years ago, and uh, my wife is still married to me, she still <laughs> loves me, and um, she still uh, uh, believes in me, and, and so do my mom and dad and all of my crew. So when I um, come up with some crazy idea that that I think we can do this. Um, I always have to kind of remind them of what we did in 98, and um, you know, usually I got their support. So this is, uh, this car was getting, the bikes were getting as much look as the cars. Uh, yeah, well, when you've got a trailer hitch on your car, you know, you can use it for all sorts of things. And so um, last year, uh, we, we used to put on this Porsche camp out up at our place in Oregon, and so, from 1994 until 2012, we'd invite everybody to come up to Oregon and, and uh, visit our place. And, and uh, we stopped doing that in 2012. But last year, we did a, a camp out reunion. And again, I needed to take, uh, now that we're living back down in California, I needed to transport a bunch of stuff up to Oregon. So we built a little trailer and uh, decided that we'll pack stuff on it and uh, pack my bikes on it. And so that's how the bike trailer came about. And the bikes themselves, um, the one on the right is uh, a titanium bike built by a company in, uh, in New Hampshire, independent fabrication. Uh, we built an all-wheel drive 356 for the owner of that bike. Um, and then the one on, uh, on the left is uh, Vintage Electric. Um, Vintage Electric is a company out of the Bay Area that builds really amazing electric bicycles. And um, they came to me, uh, it was about four years, three years ago here in Monterey, we did a, a joint display together and they had one of their bikes and I was riding it all around and I said, man, I'd love to, to work with you guys. So I got together with them and designed this bike and uh, we did a limited edition run of, of these electric bikes. 
um, and they all sold out, but uh, this was the prototype bike that we did. Um, and for those of you that follow me on Instagram, um, the bike got stolen, and thanks to social media, uh, the bike was recovered because uh, it was stolen from me, and within six hours after me posting on uh, Instagram that my bike was stolen, I had videos and pictures of the guy uh, riding it down the road, and a, a month later, uh, they arrested him, So, uh, and I got my bike back. That so. would be kind of like stealing this car. It stands out quite a bit. It, it does, and because the bikes are pretty unique, there's a couple stories that go along with that, but because we built 50 of them, uh, there was one at UCLA on campus. Well, I get a call from security at UCLA. We just caught the bike thief. We just caught the bike thief. And the guy's like, I'm not the bike thief. And he, go, and, and he goes, let me talk to Rod Emery. And so he gets on the phone with me. He's like, Rod, you got to convince these guys I'm not the bike thief. And I said, I don't know who you are. I said, what serial number is your bike? And he says, number seven. They think it's number one. And I, so I, I talked to him, and uh, he wasn't the bike thief and they let him go. Um, and then there was another guy down in Hollywood who was riding one of the bikes, and he got pulled over, and the cops you know, were harassing him. But um, turns out that uh, the actual bike thief was, uh, was nailed. He got uh, uh, a year probation and uh, you know, hopefully more than a slap on the hand. But. That was a great story. Yeah. Well, Rod, thank you for coming. Uh, great stories, and uh, your, your cars are beautiful. I know on the East Coast they love them. Uh, you had the all-wheel drive 356 that you did, which um, it was so subtle that I had to tell people to look closely inside and at the tunnel because it, where most people would have made it look obvious that it was all-wheel drive, this was very subtle how you did it, and uh, it looked like a stock 356. Well, thank you. I mean, going back to kind of what my grandfather and my father taught me is uh, customize everything but make it look like it hasn't been customized and and honor Porsche and the, you know the, the heritage of what got you there and uh, so the all-wheel drive through 56 the goal was to to make it look like a sleeper and and uh, give it all those cool things but but uh, make it look a little more undetectable